Good afternoon. Um, I'm Shamit Sagar. It's shortly after 12 o'clock on Monday the 26th, and you're very welcome to this uh, online session which unites uh, several different players. Uh, there is to begin with um, our primary hosts uh, this afternoon, which is the Mindaroo Foundation and particularly the Thrive by Five initiative. We'll hear more about that later on. In addition, we have the Telecom Kids Institute who've been doing some substantive work and research in this area. And then lastly, it's my great pleasure to be co-hosting the University of Western Australia Public Policy Institute as part of this exercise. So you're very welcome. And in the course of the next hour, I hope we will be able to discuss and, and drill into some very important issues around the raising of the next generation of uh, children and young adults, no doubt, in Western Australia. We're also here to launch a co-lab paper that has been um, in gestation for some time, and we'll be hearing from Rosemary Cahill, one of our participants, in a short while. Uh, and can I also, before I go very much further, do two things. One is to introduce what the UWA PPI is. For those of you who don't know, the Pollux Institute was established in 2018. Uh, I was recruited in 2019 to become its inaugural director. And in a sentence or two, the purpose of the Institute is to ensure that uh, our oldest standing university in the state uh, becomes much more civic minded in the future. Uh, there is a suspicion in Australian higher education and even globally that universities can sometimes be standoff and stand alone to interest, as we say in our own research, our footnotes in the case of UWA, uh, our lawns. Uh, but what we want to do is make sure that the fruits of the research that we've been doing across the whole range of faculty, the whole range of areas, is more uh, effectively fed into discussion and debate about public policy, but also practical action. And I think this afternoon's event is a very good example of precisely that. Uh, that's enough about us. Um, a couple of further things. Before I go any further, can I also uh, share with you the UWA Nungar Acknowledgement? which is to say that UWA acknowledged that its campus is situated on Nungar land and that the Nungar people remain the spiritual and cult cultural custodians of their land and continue to practice their values, languages, beliefs and knowledge. Therefore, on behalf, on behalf of the university, I wish to pay tribute to their leaders and elders past, present and future. Thank you. Just a couple of words about housekeeping. Um, for those of you not aware, we will be formally recording uh, this session. So um, be very mindful of what you want to say in the public domain. Uh, and if you don't, then just you know hold back and, and think about how you want to project uh, your contribution. Uh, it would be helpful to everyone, if possible, if you could leave your video on. And when you're dealing with these large online events, it's rather helpful to see who's out there. And I think on a related point, it'd be useful to have your actual name there, it'd be useful if you get involved in the discussion uh, to introduce who you are but also on the q a if you would like to ask a question of our panelists later on please use the chat function you'll be familiar with that uh, and in doing so just make sure that we know who you are in the background we recognize there'll be lots and lots of questions that people want to ask so our job uh, in the back room will be to brigade those and condense those into a, a small number and then lastly please make sure that uh, your uh, microphone is muted throughout all of this and we'll uh, make sure that you're um, unmuted when you're called upon to make a uh, question in the Q&A session. Right, we should move on. Um, we are delighted and very privileged to be joined this afternoon by a distinguished panel who have a great deal uh, to say in this area. And they spent a lot of time, I think, uh, pushing forward not only what is known in research, but also some very important practical uh, proposals. To begin, we have the uh, chair uh, and the leader of the Thrive by Five initiative at Mindrew, Jay Weatherall. Uh, Jay is a former premier of South Australia and now is uh, very much focused upon this as the centerpiece of his activities here in WA. Second of all, we have the West's political editor, Lani Scar. Uh, she'll be joining the panel later on. Thirdly, we have our very own Geraldine Nalon, who's from the Graduate School of Education at UWA. Uh, Fourthly, Linda Savage, who will be known to some of you as a former MP in WA and currently an ambassador for children and young people in the state. And fifthly and finally, we have Dr. Rosemary Cahill, who's been working with TKI uh, over a period of time and in fact will be uh, uh, headlining in terms of sharing with us the fruits of an important paper that she's just published with colleagues as part of the CoLab initiative at TKI. So, 
Time is of the essence. Can I swiftly turn to my colleague, Rosemary, who is now going to spend up to 10 minutes going through uh, the key points of this research and in doing so, put forward some propositions for us to discuss. I gather, Rosemary, you'll be sharing a presentation. Uh, can I just hand over to you right now? Thanks, Jamit, and thanks for, the, uh, for that introduction. And it's lovely to see uh, numerous colleagues, uh, many of whom I recognize on this town hall um, event. So it's lovely to see you. I'm in the throes of sharing a paper. Um, uh, I wonder, Shamit, if you could just confirm that it's come through. I'm looking to my colleague, Afsa, who is going Not to- Not yet, Rosemary. Okay. There okay, that should be there now. Okay, that's terrific. So I'm, um, as I say, it's it's my pleasure to actually share this paper today. Um, but I would just acknowledge, first of all, um, that uh, the impetus for this paper uh, was um, really through colleagues at Telethon Kids Institute, um, through CoLab, who've been here for for longer than than my re relatively recent arrival, and um, and this is really a culmination of a paper series. Um, which we have developed in, in recent years. Um, it's the fifth and final instalment in this series, which, which seeks to uh, conduct some secondary research about um, uh, the pathway of early childhood um, within Western Australia uh, in order to identify gaps and strengths um, and really with a view to informing improvements going forward. Um, authors that have participated to the past papers um, have been jo uh, David Ansell, Jonathan Cook and Kim Clark. And of course, we're, we're building upon really important research by, by many colleagues, probably some of whom are participating today in this, in this webinar. The preceding papers um, are noted there, one about a look back, uh, one at some current status of WA's children in paper two, uh, an exploration of issues, and then finally what the research says. So policy paper five I'm talking about today is really putting forward a vision for an integrated early childhood system in Western Australia. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about that. It was released just recently and, uh, and you know, it, it's, it's going to provide a platform for discussion. So basically we're talking about envisaging a world where every family with, with a child under five can get the advice and support that they need um, from pregnancy right through to the first day of compulsory school. Because of course, you know, there is universal provision and it's established across the country in terms of schooling. Um, however, that universal provision uh, for children prior to school entry has yet to be established, yet to be better coordinated. And the research is pretty clear that that uh, would be a really tremendous investment in terms of children's learning development and well-being. So in this sort of integrated space, um, families would be able to get the support that they need. Um, and it would be readily accessible uh, in a local place. And possibly uh, there are some examples, including here in Western Australia, where if that access were um, available through the local school, which is readily accessible and understood and non-stigmatised, then that would be beneficial for families. Uh, it would be a coordinated suite of complementary services and that notion of coordination is vital. Um, and, and families would really be in the driving seat, able to pick and choose according to their changing needs and circumstances. And also, of course, their aspirations and preferences, because there's no, there's no one way to raise a child. And, and part of Australia's rich cultural diversity is really um, uh, built uh, through, through child rearing practices. And so really building upon and maintaining that, that diversity is, is a strength within our community. But clearly that needs to be um, uh, complemented by what good research says um, is, is uh, in, in children's best interests and the best interests of families. It would be readily available and it would be an entitlement, many of which, the, you know, many of the services would be provided free of charge, just as right at the moment in Western Australia, universal health checks and kindergarten provision and programs um, such as those provided through child and parent centres and KindyLink are free of charge for families. There are five essential and complementary elements of, of this, um, of this uh, system that we envisage. 
uh, and they're listed there. High quality is, is fundamental. Um, access is important, but quality is also important, affordable and universal. Um, secondly, they, they, it would incorporate a degree of uh, proportionality so that families with greatest needs um, have, have additional um, assistance and support. Uh, it would be integrated in, and multidisciplinary and in every community. Um, and, uh, and it would build upon existing capacities and also there would be um, very deliberate coordination. It wouldn't just be a system that's left to chance, there would be very deliberate and careful coordination of this particular system and a joint monitoring system. So each of these five elements was unpacked in the paper that we have developed and released. And, and I'll just briefly talk about each of those elements. So at element one, in terms of this high quality, affordable universal services, it would be a suite of complementary services across that, you know, maternal and child health, parenting support and early learning services, including, you know, play group childcare services. I know that, um, that, that the term childcare is not comfortable for many, but it's a familiar term. So we've used it here. And of course, kindergarten leading seamlessly into high quality ongoing universal schooling for children from the compulsory age of school, which of course in Western Australia kicks in at the pre-primary year. Um, importantly, there would be sufficient quality so that families and children don't need to go on wait lists. That's because the families most likely to be on wait lists are those that are, um, are, you know, have, have the least social capital at the moment. Um, it would operate as a cohesive system um, which would be a regular and welcoming touch point for families. Now, the good news is that many of these services are already available in most parts of our vast state, and that's a real uh, credit to policy developers and, and visionaries over the past you know, decades. But the bad news is that service utilisation is lowest among the families with the greatest needs. Um, then the services are not widely understood and, and, and in some cases, uh, families don't feel as if they have a strong sense of belonging and, and purpose in terms of using those services. So a much greater level of coordination is required to optimise the use and, and, the, and, the, um, uh, and the benefits that families can reap from the, the existing services. So at Element 1, include, it's prov this provision of high quality, affordable, uh, universal services. Uh, element two is this, is this notion of proportionality, that there are additional services available for families with additional needs. And, and this, this might be uh, short-term needs that pass quickly, you know, some traumatic effect, uh, event, which means that families need some additional assistance, fairly immediate and, and tailored according to, you know, the nature of the challenge that they are facing. They're in the driving seat and, and making use of, of those services, or they might be longer-term chronic hardship. Now, each of those different scenarios requires different kinds of, of uh, responses. And the, and, and the proportionality would, inc would include provision to actually be nimble and be able to attend to those different needs. Um, it would ensure that, that um, families that need the additional support have a, have a major role in shaping the nature, the frequency and the source of that support. Um, the services would be non-judgmental, uh, non culturally safe and responsive. They would always be welcoming. Families would feel as if they could go there and, and feel as if they can ask those silly questions that they might feel a little embarrassed about. Um, and, and they would constantly be feeling supported. And, um, and that they may take the form, as that noted at the bottom there, of an extra dosage of the universal services, or it might be more specialised support. So it might be it might be an additional breadth of the provision or additional um, speciality. So that notion of proportionality goes for depth as well as breadth. Um, and, and many of you will be familiar with Bronfenbrenner's model, which is sort of stylized here, and we've referred to it as the circles of influence. We recognize that these circles of influence are interactive and that, uh, and that while, while uh, the proportional um, sort of additional services might cater for needs at the child level, the family level, or the community level, uh, or indeed the wider world, um, these, the additional needs at any one of those sort of circles um, really uh, occurs in isolation of the other circles. So it would need to be uh, constructed in a way that makes, makes uh, you know, recognises the interaction across those different circles of influence. So element three in our vision is this integrated multidisciplinary team in every community. 
Um, they can access, it, access that at one convenient location in each suburban town. We're suggesting that schools are one prime candidate for that, but it's not the only place that those, those services and that multidisciplinary, uh, multidisciplinary team may be um, accessible. Uh, there would need to be um, uh, special consideration to how this could be achieved in remote and rural localities and, uh, and, and, that, and, and ways that those practitioners can build solid and strong growing relationships. Um, importantly, this model is not one where, gen where, where generalist practitioners are asked to be specialists and do all things for all people, but largely they broker that support uh, in different places. Element four is really very deliberately acknowledging and building upon community ca capacity. And, and the point, um, the second dot point there, that parents have strong views about what they want and what they do not want for their children. And, um, and they engage with services that match their values and expectations. And frankly, they, they avoid those that do not. So it's really important that the services are responsive to uh, what families want. They have capacity to hear what families want and respond to that uh, in ways that are beneficial for their children. Um, there would be an ongoing joint um, monitoring system so that families are not permitted to slip through the cracks. And also importantly, to ensure that specialist referrals where children have additional needs, that there's capacity to make sure that those referrals are followed up so that the multidisciplinary team within each community would have a responsibility for making sure that those, those families are supported to actually follow up on that. The paper includes an appendix which really very deliberately takes the perspective of constructing this system from the perspective of families. Uh, it seeks to avoid that trap of, of, of creating a, a system that takes a service centric view and having worked in a service, I, I know that, the, you know, how seductive it is to sort of say, well, this is what we need to construct for families without first and foremost asking families what they need. So really taking that focus on families. And in summary, um, you know, the, the paper is, is fairly accessible and readable, but the, the bottom point there is that only governments have the authority and the resources to make the changes required. Um, so what we require of governance at local, state and federal level is to really advance through good governance, quality assurance, leadership and adequate funding, the kind of model um, and the, uh, the vision that we have uh, uh, outlined in the paper, which is a really solid evidence base and, um, and can point to examples through the policy series where this has been achieved and can be built upon um, into the future. So that's a, a sprint through the paper. Uh, my 10 minutes went off when my alarm went off. So I'm really, uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing the discussion that unfolds forward. Thank you. So thank you, Rosemary, and um, for that you know, magisterial overview. That's uh, it's a great summary of the paper, and there's a lot of uh, food for thought. Um, can I also just point out to our audience that, that um, Rosemary's you know, formal affiliation is that she's been the chief investigator at uh, TKI on this project, um, and that it's a 10-year partnership, I'm learning, a landmark partnership between the state government and the Mindaroo Foundation. So there's a lot of mileage in this, it seems to me. This is something that if it's for the long haul, we need to, um, we need to be sort of taking a, a sort of a, a sort of equally long vision as to where we want to be in half a generation. Um, can I, um, before we go any further, just simply just uh, hand over to my colleague, Jay, who is now going to take us through a... Um, a discussion with the panel and so on. Jay. Thank you, Shamit. Uh, thank you for the University of Western Australia for, for partnering with us. And, and thank you, Rosemary, for uh, that lovely synopsis of uh, a much more detailed paper. It was, it was really clear and very helpful for us. Um, my role is um, CEO of an initiative called Thrive by Five within a, a philanthropic foundation called Mindaroo. Uh, Mindaroo Foundation is uh, the philanthropic initiative of uh, Nicola and Andrew Forrest and really reflects a 20-year commitment to uh, investing in children, starting with the Australian Children's Trust, and it's a particular personal passion of Nicola Forrest, who, whose own journey on this matter probably mirrors the journey of many of the people in this room, that is that uh, we've been putting high quality evidence and information in front of policy makers and decision makers for a long time now. 
uh, without necessarily seeing the sort of change that, that we all really expect in the early years. And um, Nicola has arrived at the view, and, and certainly one that I strongly share, that we need to put pressure on the political process. And, and so hence the idea of a, a national political campaign to put early childhood on the political agenda was born. The campaign's called Thrive by Five. There's a banner behind me. I'd be grateful if you went to the website, thrivebyfive.org.au and signed up. But the, the essence of it is to, is to make sure that we close the gap between between what we know about the importance of the early years and what we do. Um, I want to, uh, so this, this forum that we're very proud to, to support is really a contribution to the idea of putting early childhood on the agenda with a dialogue. So this, isn't, this doesn't represent a settled view about uh, what should happen, but it's a, an incredibly valuable contribution by Telethon Kids Institute. And we're very proud of it. Um, one of the things though that I think is worth saying at the outset is whenever we discuss challenges with our system of early childhood, um, it's um, some people hear that as a criticism of their involvement in the system. And I want to say very clearly at the outset that anybody that's been involved in working in our system of early childhood uh, should be honoured and respected for the role that they play because many, uh, many do that for very poor levels of remuneration, for very precarious employment, and they do extraordinary things where usually above and beyond the call of duty in making connections with families and caring beautifully and uh, educating our children. So those educators that comprise the large bulk of the workforce here, the nurses, the social workers, in that broad system that we call early childhood development, are entitled to respect and nothing uh, that we described today about the problems in the system should be taken as a criticism of them. But I think we all realise that uh, we've been uh, really struggling under the burden of a, a system that doesn't do as well as it could by those children in the early years because we know how profound that is for their future trajectory as Rosemary has so beautifully described. So my job now is to, is to really introduce a range of panellists and post some questions to them as thought um, uh, starters. And then a little bit later, there'll be an opportunity for you to uh, submit questions. So you can submit them through the chat function and I'll read them out uh, towards the back end of today's meeting. Um, so uh, the first question is, is really to Shamit. Um, Shamit, thank you again for introducing um, Rosemary. And um, I suppose the first reflection is, what did you think of the paper? And what do you think of Colab's vision from a public policy standpoint? Uh, thank you, um, Jay, for that. Look, I'm gonna be brief. Um, I, I entirely um, agree with the observation you've made, and it's implicit in Rosemary's paper, that there is probably no real shortage uh, in the evidence base that makes a compelling case for us to invest in early years. And we can argue and debate about where the emphasis should lie or which one intervention or the other. But this is one area of social policy where the shelves are literally heaving with the amount of evidence that's been gathered of all kinds with different you know, methodological backgrounds that makes this very, very compelling case. So as you rightly point out, and this paper is saying, it isn't terribly a kind of question of what are we missing? You know, what do we need to demonstrate? If we can only sort of pull up the drains more, we can find out more about the kind of compelling case. The case is very compelling. You can always improve, but I wouldn't particularly put the emphasis there. It's much more to do with, as you say, um, a kind of political debate, but actually how would you build public support? You know, where's the pressure? Where do we feel sensitive? On the one hand, we feel very strongly about our children. Uh, there isn't a parent who's sort of tuned in today or, or out there in Perth who doesn't take this very seriously. On the other hand, there's lots and lots of uh, skepticism and misgivings. So I think that's the positive side, that's the good news. But if I had to emphasize one thing in all this, what I saw in the paper, it's this problem that Rosemary herself identified and she used the term proportionality. You remember she mentioned it a few times and she's talked about, we've got to be careful that we give more assistance where it's due. And, and I, I think that's right, but look, just be careful on this, which is that on the one hand, the, the program the campaign is talking about and the papers talking about a universal model that means everyone everyone who's a parent everyone who's going to be a parent 
get sort of swept up in uh, where this, this, this initiative is going. And the opposite of that is to be very targeted. And you need to be very, very careful about which, which you um, expect, because the reality is that um, in terms of what governments can do, a lot of these things are taking place fairly successfully in particular neighborhoods, in particular families. Um, this is not something that should be particularly, according to me, be prioritized here in Perth in our kind of Western suburbs. Always happy to spend the discretionary dollar, but I don't think that's the priority here. And that leaves you with the question of, we want to provide these integrated services, we want to be universal, but actually, you know, whose interests, who needs this more than others? And I think we just got to, um, you know, try to emphasize where, where that lies. Um, she also mentioned this point about social capital. It's a piece of jargon in academia, social research. It means, when you translate, it means not only what do you know, but who do you know? How do you go about finding out about good quality um, reading schemes, good quality uh, interventions for kids, uh, family support, those who are in difficulty? How do you find out? Well, it's important the government step in, but there are many, many parents already in our state who believe they know the answers to these questions and oftentimes probably do. And that makes me think we want to be a bit careful about being that universal. In the end, uh, this is taxpayers' dollars that will mostly be involved in this. And I think the priority would lie in focusing upon the hardest to reach groups, those that need the most. That's just my view. I'll declare an interest. Um, uh, 15 odd years ago, I was dealing with early years interventions in the Blair government in the UK. We set up the UK Sure Start program, very, very successful, doing all the things that Rosemary is advocating. Uh, but in the end, I think we probably privately concluded that it was going to be a challenge to try and do this right across the board for all parents in all neighbourhoods. So therefore, we conceded on the back of the experience that there were going to have to be priorities. We should start with them and rather, rather than end with them at the end. Um, I won't carry on. You've got the general gist of what I think. We should hear from other members of the panel. Back to you, Jay. Thank you, Shaman. And um, uh, my next question is going to be directed to Dr. Geraldine Nayland. Uh, Geraldine is a political scientist and lecturer at the Graduate School of Education, holding the position of course coordinator for the Masters of Teaching Early Childhood Education. And she's lectured in both policy and pedagogy in early childhood education and care. So Geraldine, welcome. And um, can I put a question to you? What does your early learning sector uh, experience tell you about which change is the most important change for right now? What should we be prioritizing? Well, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to read this paper and to, uh, to speak about it today. I was very pleased to read it because the vision builds on what is regarded as the first principle of good community development, and that is to build on existing services. And this vision has certainly sets out to do this. So I congratulate you on that because the early childhood sector has been described in the past by uh, Professor Urban as involving a variety of stakeholders across health, education, training, as well as children's services. Very often they pursue their own interests and very often at times these interests can be contradictory. So it is admirable to see a vision in a coherent way that looks at the early childhood sector. Second point I'd like to make is that this proposed integrated system reminds me of services that I've seen in the Nordic countries, wraparound services, building on well-qualified staff, professional staff, staff, developing and maintaining relationships. The paper talks so much about relationships with children, their families and communities. And it's very much um, emphasized in the smiling professional face at the door. And that is, um, really important. Now I teach early childhood education and care and policy here to uh, pre-service teachers who will be qualified to work between the ages of birth and age eight. And these are exactly the stakeholders who will play a major part in bringing this vision to fruition. These will be the smiling faces at the door and already are. When I explore with them various models, the Nordic models and so on, 
they very quickly become disillusioned concerning their own future careers if they choose to work in the younger section, the birth to um, uh, infancy, toddlers, um, pre kindy because there is no future for them to continue to work as that friendly face because of the current employment regime in the uh, Australian system. ASECWA, the Australian Early Childhood Qualifications Authority this month, released their preliminary research and analysis of Australians' children education and care services, and they found that workforce retention is a critical issue, which affects service quality. Again, it's about developing and building and maintaining relationships. So at a policy level, the dichotomy between care and education continues to value education over care. And those working in the childcare sector do not enjoy parity in terms of wages, holidays, professional progression for those working in the, in the younger section. Eventually and inevitably, they will move to work into the government sector. As Jay has pointed out, they are very, uh, they're not, they're not, they're, their remuneration is not what it ought to be. They are largely a gendered workforce, largely women. And at that, this time in their career, they need to get on with getting mortgages and you know having families. So we're going to lose them. And the central contradiction here is that contemporary pedagogy recognizes the importance of relationships and sustained learning. Yet in maintaining that very precious relationship is compromised at the moment because that latest report is telling us that we have a turnover level of around 33% in early childhood settings. And when we look at the policy behind that, we can see that these are not government funded, rather they're profit-making ventures that operate very often close to the financial edge and they are unable to offer parity in pay. So this paper rightly calls for the government to bind together early childhood systems through governance, quality assurance, leadership and adequate funding. And I see a way going forward to build on existing services so that children thrive by five. But I believe that such a vision will have a better chance of success if qualified professional early childhood staff are given parity with their colleagues in the teaching profession. And that's a just parity because they are equally qualified. They will professionalize the early childhood sector and they will be the glue that gets early childhood education and care provision right from the start. So I'm interested in your views, if you can see a way that CoLab can find a way to address the parity issue for those well-qualified professional teachers and to keep that smile on their face. Lovely. Thank you, Geraldine. Uh, Geraldine, that's uh, a, a wonderful presentation. Um, could I quickly now go to Linda Savage? Uh, Linda, uh, as many of you know, was a member of the Western Australian Parliament and her personal passion was, of course, the early years. And uh, she now, is an inaugural convener, of course, of the Valuing Children's Initiative and continues as an ambassador for children and young people in Western Australia. Uh, Linda has been a champion for this cause for a long period. And Linda, I'd just like to ask you, um, we know for years there's been this robust and uncontested evidence about the critical importance of the early years. Um, what are some of the things that you think are standing in the way of the barriers uh, to reform in this area? Um, well, thank you, Jay, and thank you, Rosemary, for your presentation, and thank you to everyone at CoLab um, and uh, Nicola Forrest Mindaroo, who since 2007 have done so much work in the early uh, childhood development space with the core story messaging, the Bright Tomorrows, the Child Development Atlas, amongst other things. Rosemary, um, as your paper points out, um, a couple of very important reasons. Um, for um, what seems to be the very slow pace of the translation of what we know into action across so many um, areas of policy, the fragmentation of services, the failure to date for government to really take the lead. As you said, I'm sure those people listening could think of many more. Uh, the lack of someone ultimately responsible in government, um, that could be a minister or an early childhood office, um, 
following on from what you said, Geraldine, the lack of value accorded to those who care for the young, um, both um, as paid children, educators, and of course for mothers, the recognition of that work. Um, before I make my comments, I'd just like to say on the positive side, there has been some movement, although it sometimes seems glacial. We have got the uh, state government here with the 12, one of the 12 priorities is improving the health and well-being of children and the work that's being done uh, with Mindaroo. Um, we've got child and parent centres, we've got um, really a robust system in the community and child health nurses system um, to build upon. Um, and we've got a lot of people in the not-for-profit sector. And perhaps something that we don't um, talk about enough. One of the few things in a very polarised and fractious community and in debate is um, the belief that all children do deserve the same opportunities in life. Um, at least at that, uh, at that high level, I think that that is um, something that most Australians would agree that regardless of the circumstances of a child's birth, who their parents are, they deserve that good enough start in life to be enabled to thrive and uh, uh, take their chances. So I'd like to talk a bit um, about um, uh, what, what a racy and people like Fiona Stanley and June Oscar see as perhaps the missing step in when we're talking about um, progressing public policy in, in areas like uh, early childhood and children generally. And that's the failure by society really to place children at the center and for that then by extension to be reflected in public policy. Um, uh, you know, when I think about public policy and um, the time I was a member of parliament, I think of it this way, public policy is a choice. It's what governments choose to do and what they choose not to do. And it's a moral choice, what they ought to do and, and what they don't do. It's driven by the priorities that adults and the attitudes of the community um, make the priorities. So this is where a racy and work that they did over a decade ago talked about a missing step. And they talked about looking at how we value children, valuing children drive, uh, drives our attitudes to children, and that in turn impacts on public policy and the choices that are made and what, what is considered to be adequate public policy. I think um, if you look back, it's often easiest to see how that impacts. So it's only in the last 50 years that children were shipped across the world from England to go to institutions because of the circumstances so-called of their parents. That was considered to be acting in the interests of children and that that was considered reflective of community views and attitudes. Um, I think that that role that culture and attitudes play in driving public policy, um, and I mean at a deeper level, um, needs to be uh, kept in mind. I'm just going to point to, in the short time, I have a couple of those attitudes that I think are impacting in the early years area. I said earlier um, about the lack of value given for the caring of the young, both in the paid and unpaid workforce. The reality is out there, there are still people who think of it as little more than babysitting. Um, and that's something, Geraldine, I know um, in the work you're doing and what you were talking about um, was very important. That is an attitude. Another one is that children today have never had it so good. So we're actually quite complacent as a society about where children are. Um, we tend to focus on uh, public policy um, and certainly coverage of it um, when there's a catastrophic failing. Um, that enables us then, I think, to, and I often hear this too, to really divide children into the, the few at the extremes and the rest who most reports begin by saying are faring well. When I speak to people working with children from educators, health workers, um, uh, in, uh, psychiatrists, what they say to me about children is that the real story is that some children are doing well, some children are struggling, 
many will need assistance and services at some time during childhood and that all children need that backbone of universal services if they if they are to thrive and no one no individual can provide that i think childcare done well is one of those universal services another attitude that i think um, is uh, a barrier or maybe um, uh, slows down the action um, that we need to take and shapes the reality in the area of child policy is the belief that everything we do is in the best interests of children. Now I won't go into the background of that phrase um, and uh, what it actually means, but I think uh, that aspiration has almost morphed into an assumption that that is what we are doing. I think we should judge ourselves um, and ask ourselves slightly harder questions about what, uh, what we do for children, how far we've evolved in our attitudes and beliefs. Because as I said, it is attitudes and beliefs that build together to influence public policy. And that's what the community, all of us have that role in. So perhaps I'll leave it at that, um, Jay, just to give you a Thank flavor you. of that way of thinking. Thank you very much, Linda. And uh, can I now turn to Lani Scar? Lani is a federal political editor of the West Australian newspaper, and she's a mum of four, including triplets. So uh, who, who better to talk to us about this critically important topic? Um, also, Lani, thanks for uh, your wonderful article in today's paper. So I'd just like to ask you a question really about the current political situation and your role. And, um, and how, in particular, in relation to Western Australia, would, do you think this should inform the way in which we approach uh, the West Australian government? Um, thank you, Jay, and thanks so much um, for having me involved in today. Um, thanks for allowing me to read the policy paper first and, and having it in today's paper as well. So I think that there's no greater issue that we need to address than early childhood education, which I've written about before. Uh, and, and you know, all of us who are um, on this discussion today know, I think that if we're wanting to set up our nation, then we really need to get early childhood education right. Um, in terms of governments, I think that obviously we saw uh, the opposition put it on the radar in a significant way in the budget reply speech and hopefully the federal government will take note of that. But in terms of the WA government, I think that they too need to, to make it a priority and make sure that they are, um, you know, keeping early childhood education and how to improve that high on the agenda because it doesn't just benefit children, it doesn't just benefit parents, but it also benefits the nation as a whole. Because if we can have children in those early years when the biggest brain development is occurring, if we can have them achieving their potential, then they're going to go on to have more successful jobs. They're going to contribute greater to GDP. We're, we're going to all be better off as a nation. So I just think this is something that governments both state and federal really shouldn't ignore or push to the side anymore because it, especially given we are going through the current economic circumstances that we are if we're going to have children that are competitive on the world stage then we really really need to get early early childhood education right and the funding levels for early childhood education right well thank you very much lani uh, for that contribution and um I think that tees us up beautifully for a, a bit of a group chat and um, I'm more than happy for people to put through questions. I know that there are already some, uh, uh, some interesting debates and dialogue that's occurring on the online chat. I just wanted to take up uh, one of the contributions which I've seen uh, uh, that um, in front of the more recent contributions about referencing uh, Reggio Emilia, which is a, a small city in the, the Northern Italy which has a philosophy of early childhood development, which is based on reimagining uh, the vision of the child in society. Instead of the child being seen as a weak subject uh, with needs, it, it promotes the notion of a, a competent, powerful uh, citizen with rights. Uh, and it's, it's a big shift in thinking. Um, it now accords 
uh, with what we understand about how a child's brain develops. Uh, and the Reggio model reinforces this reciprocity that exists between the child, the parent and the proper community in terms of the way in which they develop. To me, it's a, an incredibly powerful and hopeful message about reimagining early childhood. And just as that city tried to rebuild itself uh, out of the ruins of World War II by focusing on, on children, uh, in the same way as we contemplate a post-pandemic world, uh, I wonder whether nation building can once again begin with little children. So I'm um, more than happy for people to put through additional questions that may, they may have. I know that um, uh, I think I've seen a, a contribution by uh, Doreen, um, I think uh, online about the, the importance of language. Um, I was wondering if we could uh, unmute um, uh, Doreen to actually see if she wanted to uh, discuss that for us. Thanks, Jay. One of the things that um, struck me about Rosemary's paper and the conversations that have been surrounding it is that if we're going to be working across professional groups and if we're going to encourage greater work between professional groups, we need very early to start understanding the language of the different professional groups and the processes and how people interact and how people work. It's one of the parts of systems development or systems change that needs to be uh, innovated very early on because language is so slow to change. So whilst it might seem to be something that could be considered down the track, I, I raise it because of my concerns that that's part of the cultural change that may be indeed hardest to move. But I, I love what's in the paper in terms of the recognition that the child is at the centre. And if we use the child as the base for our language and start redeveloping it and thinking about how our language works and how our professional languages work, I think we're going to be much better at communicating with each other. And most importantly, the practitioners who are working in those fields, these fields that we want to connect up, will um, see it as much more of a possible change. They will see these changes as, as doable if they can understand the language around the changes. Thank you very much uh, for that, Doreen. And um, one of the uh, contributions that, that's also been made uh, is uh, really this question of uh, the dilemma of universal versus targeted. Uh, obviously the paper itself uh, comes down on the side of universal services, but obviously also a, a, um, a, a need for proportionality. Uh, I know that there's been some uh, discussion online. I think the Nagala team of Western Australia have made a a contribution about the tension between the provision of universal services and also targeted services. I wonder whether somebody from that team would like to enter the, the, the discussion at this point. Okay. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jenny Allen and Fiona Beermeyer from the gala. Um, it's always a tension, um, I think, with any of our service delivery around that issue of numbers which is more achievable with universal services because it's not the same intensity of support um, versus highly intensive targeted services where people um, and their children have higher needs of support. Um, funding models contribute to that, um, that dilemma because if you are assessed on numbers, then it is always a risk that providers will go down the path of least resistance um, and that would mean um, universal services are going to give you those results more readily than if you're needing to target uh, those families that are experiencing high levels of vulnerability. So um, I think that it needs to be clear in any policy or any programs about what is required and what that balance might be between the universal services and that, that universal proportionality because it, it's an ongoing issue for providers. Yeah. Look, I, th I think that's a this is a critical discussion. It's interesting that Shamit raised this point with his sure start experience. I, I have a slightly different view from Shamit, one that accords more with the paper that's been put 
put in there by a TKI. Um, and mine isn't necessarily a policy from a policy perspective. It's it, I think there are interesting debates about the, 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 the tension between the two things from a policy and a practitioner's perspective. I suppose I look at it from a political lens and the political communication lens, uh, paradoxically, it's easier to win an argument for a universal service than it is for a targeted service. And, and partly that's the way in which the public debate gets shaped. Unfortunately, you know, we, whether we like it or not, um, disadvantage can sometimes be pathologized and, and can be quite, um, unfortunately, people and families can be pigeonholed as being almost the authors of their own misfortune, which makes it difficult for us to mobilize broad cross sections of the community to uh, provide a platform. Whereas people are more inclined to accept the notion of uh, proportional universality that the notion that Rosemary mentioned in the paper, which is that everybody gets something, but some people get more. Uh, and it's in that way, designing a system change that actually has something in it for everyone. You're able to scope in a much broader constituency for change, which gives you uh, a greater chance of being successful than if you're arguing for targeted reforms. And I think one of the burdens of this sector is that it's used to, to be frank, fighting for scraps and often fighting for, uh, amongst one another, feeling it's a zero sum game. And so we can't ask we ask for targeted because we know that uh, we don't think there'll be very much left over uh, if we don't take that approach. And I think, I suppose what we're proposing in the campaign is for us to lift our sights, to be more ambitious on behalf of children, uh, to make sure that we have both a universal system, but also the targeted services that are necessary. Does anybody want to reflect on, on that proposition? Perhaps, perhaps I could add something to that, uh, Jay. Um, see, I think there's two ways of looking at it with systems, a, a wave or, I suppose, a particle. That's the way it's been put to me. And I think when we're talking about the early years and early childhood development, we're still at the point where we're looking to create the wave for, for all children that we recognise for all children um, and many of them at some time in those years that they will benefit or need services. So I think when you divide it between, um, and this is not um, uh, criticising the need to, to add extra to the, to the few, but when you do divide it like that between the, the one extreme and then everyone else, it is much harder to take everyone with you on the journey because of that, that, that narrative. And so I, I would have thought with the early years where we're still really um, early days of trying to uh, translate what we know across the policy framework, that the universal approach has, um, has um, as, as Rosemary's outlined it, um, has merit. Um, and, um, and of course, adding uh, where you need to add extra on top of that. And that is really the reality of services for children already, certainly um, in the health system. Um, I know that there's been a lot of discussion and of course it's uh, been strongly pursued by Geraldine and her contribution uh, about the, the importance of uh, proper respect and remuneration for early childhood workers. I wonder whether we should explore this question of relationships because it does seem uh, to sit at the heart of quality uh, is the connection between uh, the relationships that are formed between the educator or other practitioner and the child and the family. Um, did anybody want to make a, a contribution about that? I know that there's been some discussion in the chat about that as well. Looks like uh, Teresa is putting her hand up. Can somebody unmute uh, Teresa? Uh, Apsa, can we unmute Teresa Rayfield? Yep, Teresa, if you just want to accept the unmute. No, sorry, I wasn't saying anything. I was just. I wasn't meaning to put my hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just got a hand up in front of your face. I thought that meant that you were. No. Trying to get my attention. Does anyone else uh, want to say something? I think somebody's here. Pauline Roberts has definitely got a real hand up. <laughs> a 
kick it on mute, Pauline, and then give and put that beautiful. That's because I was too slow to figure out how to put my digital hand up. Um, <laughs> I was just going to say similar position to Geraldine, working with pre-service teachers and um, been working um, with them for a number of years now. And a lot of the time I'm being the advocate for working more broadly. The majority of our pre-service teachers are talking about teaching in schools and I'm advocating for looking at more broadly around where they can make a difference working with young children. And it does, it comes back to those um, those pays in paying conditions, as you say, when they're going out to start their lives, a lot of them um, to get married, have mortgages, those sorts of things. We're talking about a difference of around, sometimes around $70,000 um, between working in a school and working in an early learning sector. So it's very difficult to try and get that quality education uh, or quality educators to, to work within that setting and stay within those settings where they can have a huge impact on children and families and communities um, when they're not receiving that. It, it's the recognition for the work that they're doing in terms of in, in, within the community. Um, and unfortunately it does come down to those pay, that paying conditions and where they're recognized within, within the professional standards for teachers as well um, in terms of being seeing themselves on those lead teachers and those those frameworks for moving through career progressions um, they're missing from lots of those things so I understand from a service point of view that offering um, the paying conditions to match schools is very difficult for small services so it does need to be a wider government policy level to look at that um, but I also understand government not wanting to give that money to the private sector so that's where you've got another challenge as well as around helping services that need the help um, without funneling extra money into profit-making services as well. So yeah. it's an ongoing juggle. Yeah, thank you, Pauline. And could I, could I bring in Andrea Hyman here? In a few minutes we have left. Uh, Andrea, did you want to make a quick contribution? If we could unmute Andrea. Yep, thank you. Um, yeah, I was just making a comment to what you were saying about universality and we targeted some people getting more. I just just commenting that sometimes it, it's not that they're getting more, it's just that they're getting it in a more appropriate format. So mm. for example, um, child health nurses, for most people, they might be easily access accessible down the local child health clinic. But when we delivered them in child and parent centres or in other not-for-profit organisations, they're not getting more. They're just getting it in a more appropriate format that's accessible to them where they feel more comfortable. Thank you, Andrew. That's, uh, that, that's a really powerful point. I might now, just in the few moments we have left, uh, hand back to, to Shamit. But before I do, can I just thank everybody for contributing? We'll be obviously capturing a lot of these ideas and using them to assist us to formulate how we, we move forward. So thank you so much to all of the panellists and, and to all of the people that have contributed and also on the online chat. Maybe if I could hand back now to, to Shamit. Um, Shamit will remind you, but in case he doesn't, uh, I'd like you to remind you to uh, go to thrivebyfive.org.au website. Um, if, if you want to join the campaign, this will give you an idea about what we're up to and keep you informed uh, as we progress in this this effort to uh, uh, put the early years on the on the agenda, uh, Shemin. Uh, thanks, Jay. Look, uh, so determined are we to do that. I, my notes tell me that in fact the chat function here will include the um, the sign up letter for those who are interested. <laughs> so there's no way you can escape. There's no such thing as a a lunchtime session with Mindrew, TKI, and PPI without an ask. Um, look, thank you for that. Um, can I begin, all, before I forget, to thank our panel, uh, Rosemary, Geraldine, Linda, Lanny, and Jay himself. Um, this is, a no pun intended, obviously a once in generation opportunity to get something very different done in public policy. Uh, when Jay and I were discussing this on a similar occasion a month or two ago, uh, I think the language sort of shifted around, and there were some other people involved as well, around the costs of inaction, not the costs of action. So I don't want to sort of present this as being gargantuan. And also, I think Jay's own words were, could we perhaps think a little less incrementally and think a little bit more about some radical system-wide, society-wide change? So there is this opportunity embedded in, in what this paper is saying and what the initiative is advocating. Um, but it requires, as many people have pointed out, um, probably a little less excavating for new, fresh evidence, 
always happy to do that, but probably the emphasis isn't there. And more emphasis lies upon trying to communicate this to uh, either a skeptical public, certainly a skeptical press from time to time, and politicians themselves. And Jay is well equipped to tell us about um, how you get those arguments across. And what, what there is at the heart of this, of course, is this paradox. He's quite right. Universal services are always popular because everyone's being treated the same. But at the same time, there's this task of smuggling in, as it were, these disproportionately greater benefits for some. And that's a, that's a technique, that's a trick um, to get over that paradox. So I think this campaign in many, many ways is putting the emphasis upon public attitudes, awareness, and starting exactly where we should be, which is how do you get people to focus upon universality at the same time recognizing that some will need more help than others and at different ways and at different times in their lives. Um, I wish the campaign uh, a lot of luck. I think it needs uh, a lot of backing. It needs awareness. It's exactly timed appropriately here in WA. And just to remind all of you, uh, it's in the uh, chat function. Please sign up, uh, put your back into it if you agree with the sentiment of the arguments. Uh, and no doubt we'll check in in the future with um, Jay and his team at Mindrew about the progress of the campaign and the development of further policy proposals as this campaign uh, gathers steam. Thank you very much for taking time out to join us. Um, can I hand back to, um, I guess, AFSA just to uh, sign us off now. Thank you very much. Have a good day, guys.